Welcome to another edition of the Expanding on Consciousness podcast. I am Mark Serto. In the last season, I had a wonderful conversation with author Tom Campbell. Now, if you haven't heard of Tom or his work, I highly recommend that you take a gander at his writings and his website. He's a fascinating man with an interesting theory about the nature of reality and how consciousness is actually affecting it. He presents his theory in a trilogy called My Big Toe, toe being an acronym for Theory of Everything. Very interesting read. Tom is not only an author, he's also a physicist and an engineer who worked for NASA, the U.S. Department of Defense, and the Army as a systems analyst. He also spent a good deal of time with my old friend Bob Monroe exploring and developing the first binaural beat recordings designed to help people explore deep meditation states. That's something that the two of us shared in common, and we spoke extensively about it in the last episode. If you're interested in exploring that conversation, it's episode 8 in season 1. Tom and I had a great chat. It lasted about 5 hours. So the producers and I decided that we'd break the conversation down into digestible nuggets of 1 hour long. Made sense? Because there's a lot to digest there. In this episode, Tom and I are going to dive deeply into his theory of everything. And as I promised, the rabbit hole of how consciousness affects reality and why is going to get a little deep for some of you. Others will find it fascinating and give you a lot of food for thought. Tom's theory, in my opinion, is quite sound. But at this point, like many theories about consciousness and its true nature, are still unprovable. It's a theory that many quantum physicists actually share in part, which is no surprise to me because Tom is a physicist. It's a theory which speaks to the idea that consciousness is fundamental, meaning that consciousness as we experience it, perhaps as all life experiences it, is not self-generated, at least not the personal self as we experience a self. Now, that's a theory that's going to make some people very uncomfortable. Take a moment to think about the implications of that idea, if you haven't already. That everything you're experiencing in your personal life and your personal sense of consciousness, what goes on in your head, is actually somehow pre-existing in some way. I'm not necessarily speaking of fate or destiny here, although that could be true as well. I'm speaking of something much more. That consciousness itself is something that exists outside of you. Not just in other people, but as a field of some sort. As an energy of some sort. And that this something, this something that we call consciousness, is experiencing itself through you in some strange way. That you are in essence a thought of something which exists outside of you, a something which has become self-aware and actually believes it has autonomy. We all have that belief, don't we? That we are unique and sovereign individuals living our lives, having our personal experiences and personal reflections or thoughts about the inflow or stimulus of information as we get it through our senses, that we make sense of the world and that we're unique in doing so? That is the current Western model of this thing that we call consciousness. That consciousness as we experience it is a compendium of sensory information or cortical stimulation in our brains and memory. That idea is in contradiction to the Eastern philosophical-slash-spiritual model of consciousness, which has long spoken of another larger consciousness, a field, an energy, living outside of our dimension and outside of us personally, which is having an experience through us. There are also variations on this theme of consciousness which many religions have also implied. So it's not really a new idea. It just doesn't sound all that scientific because it's very hard to test. But in the field of quantum theory and quantum physics, this idea exists quite easily. Tom's theory of everything goes a bit deeper than that. He's also going to share with you his thoughts about how reality is constructed due to consciousness. 
This theory is also shared by other physicists who are doing various experiments showing that this is indeed the case, although it's inexplicable at this point as to why and how it occurs, that somehow we are creating or at least affecting reality on a very subtle level and, of course, on a not-so-subtle level, on a very obvious scale. If you're unfamiliar with this theory or you're having the thought that this is just some woo-woo, new-agey stuff, I would refer you to the episodes in Season 1 with Dr. Dean Radin, Dr. Roger Nelson, and Dr. Edgar Mitchell, all of whom are physicists and scientists. It seems to me that there's a lot more to this theory than mainstream science is willing to explore deeply, and I understand, of course. As I said, these theories, these notions, they tend to make some people very uncomfortable. I'm not interested in making you comfortable during this podcast. I'm hoping to help us get to the truth of such things. As an interviewer, my job is to allow all opinions to be voiced fully. The producers and I, however, we do try very hard to get very serious minds on the hard problem of consciousness and its varied fields of study. So far, I think we've succeeded in that, and I believe that you're going to find the second series as profound and thought-provoking as the first one. So without further delay, here's part two of my conversation with author Tom Campbell. Hope you enjoy it. So you but, didn't get involved in that whole remote viewing uh, training? No, sent, no, uh, I didn't. That was, after, that was after I had gone, so right. I didn't get involved in that at all. But, you know, I'm a scientist, and I wanted to understand how this thing worked and right. why it worked and what its limitations were. So right. I never stopped doing that. You know, I was doing it with probably almost as many hours. You know, I just wasn't going to Bob. I was right. doing it on my own. And for the next 35 years, I was trying to isolate variables. Uh-huh. Well, if, if I do this differently, how does that affect the outcome? And now if I do this, you know, and I was doing that. So it's, by the time I got to, <coughs> to um, the late or yeah, middle 1990s, mm-hmm. middle 1990s, I thought I understood it enough that I wanted to, wanted to write it down. Actually, what happened is I had somebody over who was interested and they wanted me to you know, to explain to them, you know, how this consciousness thing worked and how the body fit in and all that. And I found that four or five hours later, you know, at the uh, at like four o'clock in the morning, I had gotten through it, but I knew there were holes in it, things that that my explanations didn't really follow logically. They were just things I knew, but right. I didn't know the logical path to them. So at that point, I said, you know, I need to write this down because when you write things down, you're forced to clarity. Right, right. You know, when you're just talking and in your mind, all kinds of fuzzy ideas seem like they're perfectly rational. Mm -hmm. But when you write it down and you have to put it in hard sentences, you know, something that doesn't make sense just jumps right out at you that doesn't make sense because writing makes it all slow down and get clear. Unless you're like me, then you write like you speak. And then the next thing you know, you read it back and you say, I thought I understood this perfectly. So, but I get the idea. Yeah. That's the genesis of yeah. your, of your yeah. writings. And so you- then that's where I started with the book. And then five years later, I was done and I published it in 2003, uh-huh. February, 2003. So that's kind of the, uh, the genesis. short story of the, of the long road, but that's where the book came from right so but it took me about another after uh after the five to six or seven years with bob uh it took me about another 30 years after that just every night right you know trying this trying that so what was Um, going on for you in the intervening years are you and bob part company and you're still interested you're doing the writing and are you doing experiments now for yourself I'm um, using yeah. altered states of consciousness, <clears throat> and what type of experiments were you doing? Well, mostly I was trying to, I was trying to answer those questions of in my explanation of how it all worked, where I had holes. Uh-huh. I was trying to plug those holes, trying to get information. And I don't mean going out and asking for information, but right. trying to understand through through experimentation. Well, what type how, of questions were you asking? I mean, a lot of people don't even know what questions to begin to ask. Oh, you know? well, there was lots of things that needed to be uh, resolved. Like, um, 
I had learned that I could get data out of a database, uh -huh. but I didn't have any idea why that database was there or where it came from I or see. who put the data there or why they put right. the data You're there. You're talking about non-physical data again. Yeah, okay. non-physical data okay, from good. the database. Okay. You know, Akashic Records is what uh, right. sure. we talked about it because that was the Hindu name for right. it. But right. I knew the information was there because I had accessed it and proved to myself that it was indeed accurate and, you know, accurate information. Uh -huh. So I didn't know how or where it came from. We, we knew that uh, you could go into the past in those databases and look at past lives and do other kinds of things. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of things I didn't know about it. Like, was that really real? Were those past lives some kind of reality that was different than this one? Uh -huh. Was it another reality going on? And if so, that was a, a logical problem because... And how, did how, you, does the, how, does, how does reality go on in the past? You right, know? exactly. So, we can talk about the arrow yeah, of time, so, too. Right? So, yeah, so there's problems. Right. So I had all these problems, things that didn't really add up. So I had to do experiments. One of the experiments I did for that problem was I'd go into that past life, and by this time, I had an ability to you know go to body anytime I wanted. It was just on demand, mm -hmm. and I could get a very precise um, mental space that I was in. So, and I could repeat that. I could the next day come back and precisely that spot again, mm -hmm. because I was really had now what five or six years of doing, you know, literally thousands of hours of this that I got pretty good at it. So I wanted to- And a to, strong intention I'm imagining. Yeah. And yeah, I got the noise out of my mind and then able to focus well and, and clearly and so on. So I would go to this, this, um, uh, the past, mm -hmm. I'd pick some time in the past that was eventful. I'd go in there and I'd, I'd not only watch it, but I'd get into it. I could get into that, mm -hmm. that situation where now I'm a character in it. Right. And as a character in it, I would change something. Right. I would make a change. Responsive. Right. Right. Yeah. So I'd go in and make a change and then I'd look and see how that change changed other things. So I would make a change between me and, you know, this guy, guy A, and now because of my input to A, I expected A, was he going to do exactly the same thing? Like this was just a, a movie that would never change? Would No matter what I said, would he just continue on because that was the sure. script? Right. Or would he change right. what he did because of what I told him? Right. And in that case, the, the, what he did then would change other people. Did that change roll on through? And, it just, and, yeah. <laughs> and how did that work? So I would just go do that experiment. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And I would then observe it. I'd observe what happened, mm -hmm. how he changed, what he did, and what changed. And I found out that after a while, that this was this was a database, but it was a database based on probabilities. Mm -hmm. And I realized, you know, just again, you do it a thousand times or a hundred times, and you begin to see how it works and mm -hmm. what what's consistent about it. So I could always go back to that same start frame. Mm -hmm. Okay, here we are. We're all in this room. We're all sitting around this round table and start right. now. Mm -hmm. This time I'm going to do this. Right. You know, the next time I'm going to do that. Throwing variables, and, right. Yeah, throwing, changing the variables and right. then see what happens. So it did. It, it didn't just go on like a movie. You know, the changes actually moved on. But what did they move on to? Uh -huh. They didn't change historical fact. Right. That stayed the same, even though in this thing, things were played out differently. So, see, that just told me things. It wasn't a butterfly effect that you change things here, that change things there. And it wasn't just a movie. Uh -huh. So I realized that these were probability distributions of, uh -huh. of things, of possible things that could happen. I'm curious. And to know. I, was just, I was just working my way through those possibilities. Right. So one of the possibilities was this, uh -huh. and now I was following that trail through this big database of probabilities. So I do things like that, and eventually I realize that no, it's not, you know, it's it's not live. These are not live characters. They look like they're live. You can get in and carry on conversations with them, uh -huh. but it's it's a probabilistic database that is showing all the possibilities of all the things that could have happened. Right. Not necessarily all the things that did happen. And you could wander around in this probability space. Uh -huh. And then, you know, so one thing, led, so that just gave me some insight as to how that worked and what the limits were and why it was like that. So I'm that's, the kind of re that's the kind of research I did. And I did that on literally hundreds of subjects, places where I 
I had this problem, like the problem with time. Uh, That's a problem. You know, right. It doesn't make sense. Right. You can't have the past living on, you know. And uh, so I think of different possibilities, you know, of, of how that worked. And the many worlds kind of thing came to my mind, sure. too. That was right. before many worlds even was mentioned. But right. that was an obvious, you know, solution. And I realized and the information that the, was out yeah, there. I the, mean, you're yeah, probably the, getting that. Yeah, and I was thinking about that, and and uh, that didn't actually become a thing for probably another decade. But I was doing this now in the uh, you know '80s, most of it, you know, the late late '70s, and and through the through the '80s. It wasn't until like '95 or something I started writing the book. So anyway, you mind uh, if I interject a question here? No, go ahead. So I'm curious in. to know if when you were throwing those variables out. Mm -hmm. and you were going in some kind of sequence, I'll try this, I'll try this, I'll try this, mm -hmm. and then see the outcome. Did you ever go back to one of the first variables? You know, like if you took a variable um, X, we'll call mm -hmm. it, and you saw this outcome, then you went to variable Y, and you saw a different outcome, mm -hmm. variable W, and you went to mm -hmm. this outcome. Did you ever go back to variable X and see if the same outcome came to be? Yes, and yes, I, I went back to very, yes, I'd go back to X mm -hmm. and see whether if I did the same thing, would I get the same result? What was you know, the result? Or would I get that? a different result? Uh -huh. The result of that is that if I did the exact same thing, starting from the exact same frame, uh -huh. I'd get the exact same result. Uh -huh. this I'd is, get the exact same result. What does that do to, your, does that do to your told me it was a database. Right. What does that do to your construct of predeterminism? Well, uh, I never had m much use for predeterminism. Uh, <laughs> I don't want you either for, yeah, the, for the I didn't care much for that because it took all the meaning and, and purpose, you know, out of life. Right. So I didn't really espouse that, but it is a logical uh, conclusion of materialism. Yeah. You, if you're a materialist, then you have to be a determinist. So mm -hmm. I, that was one of my, the things that I wanted to learn in this test. If I did the same thing, mm -hmm. would the same thing happen? Mm -hmm. And basically, I found out that it was yes or no. Mm -hmm. It would depend that once I realized it was a database, mm -hmm. I could then ask for, I only want to see those things that are most probable. Mm -hmm. In other words, all the probabilities, just give me that, that set of circumstances that would be the most probable thing. Right. And if I did that, and I give the same stimulus, I'd get exactly the same reactions. Mm -hmm. A would tell B, B would change C, C would change D, mm -hmm. and the whole chain would be identical. Mm -hmm. But if I said, I'd like to see what would happen, and let's use the fifth most likely, and then I would do it, and mm -hmm. I'd get changes. Mm -hmm. I'd get changes. So I could control that based on my intention of how I was querying the database. Right. Because I had all the probabilities of everything that could have happened, but only some of it did happen. It's and like an information the, feedback loop. Yeah. Yeah. So I, that was the kind of research, you know, and, mm -hmm. and experiments that I was doing to find out how does it work? What is this database? Where does this information come from? Right. And then it was later... You know, I wrote the books, and and mostly they were a, a, a theory of consciousness, mm -hmm. and I knew that consciousness was fundamental and that the physical world was derived from consciousness. Mm -hmm. But I didn't know. I'd learned that early on because mm -hmm. I, could, I could change things. I could do something in the non-physical to make a change in the physical. Right. But I couldn't do something in the physical that mm -hmm. changed anything in the, in the consciousness realm. Mm-hmm. So, so that tells you that the arrow of causality mm -hmm. flows from consciousness to the physical, not the other way around. That the physical is a, is a product of consciousness, not the creator of consciousness. Let's break that down, because the idea that consciousness is fundamental is now gaining quite a lot of ground in mm -hmm. the circ many circles. Okay, And I, I don't think a lot of people fully understand exactly what the idea that consciousness is fundamental is means break that down for the folks playing it, at home here it's not really metaphorical it's just exactly the way it sounds mm -hmm. consciousness is fundamental in other words consciousness is the source 
Like consciousness is the root. Consciousness is where everything else begins. Mm -hmm. This physical reality is a product of consciousness, mm -hmm. not the other way around. Brains don't make consciousness. Consciousness creates a virtual reality in which there are avatars mm -hmm. that have brains in their heads if you split the head open. If you don't split the head open and look, they don't have brains. They act just as if they had brains because virtual realities don't produce or calculate anything except what the players see. So if you can't see a person's brain, then why would the computer compute a brain? All right. You see, but they go as if there was a brain according to a rule set. And by that rule set, a brain would have evolved. So that's, See, eventually I back my way up into that idea. Mm -hmm. I go through all these experiments on lots of different topics. I get to the point that I say, it's all about information. Mm -hmm. And that was a big aha moment. This mm -hmm. is just about information. Mm -hmm. uh, yet I didn't know exactly where all that went, what the logical you know, consequences of that would be. But I realized everything we're talking about is information. Everything what is consciousness? Is information. Consciousness right. is awareness. What's awareness? It's awareness of this, of that, of that. Well, all those right. things is, are just information. And the and physical at, world is a subset of that information. Yeah, exactly. It's a subset of that information. So and Explain uh, that to the folks listening at home. Okay. Well, that's not so hard to explain. Uh, it is a... Right now, physicists will tell you, at least the ones that work in particle physics mm -hmm. and the ones that work in quantum theory, mm -hmm. they will tell you that reality is information-based. Mm -hmm. That's what, you know, those are the words they'll use. Mm -hmm. Reality seems to be information-based, and right. that's what their experiments tell them. Mm -hmm. They don't say it's matter-based because right. it isn't. No, it isn't. That's materialism. Mm -hmm. They'll say it's information-based. <laughs> but if you press them, well, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. They'll say, I don't know, I have no idea, I just know it's information-based. But it may well, have something to do with the wave in the particle-wave interaction. Um, Maybe. No, not really. No? No. So Is that an old it, model? The, the particle wave? Yeah, no, I mean yeah. the, the information being within the wave itself. Yeah, no, that's not, that's not, uh, that's not the way it works. Okay. There is no wave. Oh, then yeah. clue me and no, educate there, me. There is no wave. Okay. Okay, so the physicists will tell you that, it, that, that it's an information base because if they take the logical next step, I mean, that has consequences to say that it's information based. Sure. But as physicists think of the consequences, they have no idea what, where to go from there. That's the last place that they can say something that makes sense to them. <laughs> After that, right. they're lost with a way of explaining it or they don't know what to do with it. So they won't go any further than that. Mm -hmm. But the logic is this. If it's an information-based system, that means it's computable. Mm -hmm. That's just logical. It. If it's computable, that means it's a simulation or can be a simulation. Mm -hmm. If it's a simulation, that's the same as saying it's a virtual reality. Mm -hmm. Okay, so our physical reality is information-based, it's a virtual reality. Making now, it the subset of, a con of consciousness. Making it a subset. So now we have to, we have to uh, say, you know, who's the programmer? You know, where is this virtual reality? And who's, who programmed it? And where did it come from? And why? Well, there's a hundred okay. questions at least, right? Yeah, Keep going, the, right? we have those questions. So first, let's just look, though, at virtual reality. Mm -hmm. Virtual reality, and we can look at the world of Warcraft or The Sims or... No Man's Sky or whatever old, you know, virtual reality multiplayer game you want to look at. And you'll see that virtual reality has some basic attributes that are true of all virtual realities. Mm -hmm. A virtual reality is basically has just two active components, and that's a player and a computer. Mm -hmm. A player and the server. Right. Okay. Now, the, the computer computes the virtual reality in as much as what the player needs to know about what's going on in the virtual reality. Mm -hmm. So the computer creates my elf. I'm playing World of Warcraft, and I've got an elf character. Mm -hmm. So the computer gives me a picture of the elf. Now, it doesn't give me his internal organs. It doesn't give me, you know, what's running in his veins, if he has veins or not. You just, whatever it is I can see, that's what the computer gives me. I can't see inside his body, so the computer doesn't compute it. Right. So I've got this player, an elf. Now, from the... From the elf's point of view, 
from the elf's point of view, inside the virtual reality, the player is Mm non-physical. From the elf's point of view, the computer, the server, is Mm non-physical. To the elf, that virtual reality is physical. Right. You know, the elf's world with whatever's in his world in that virtual reality. Right, sure. Yeah, whatever. You know, that's what's physical to Mm -hmm. him. Right. Okay. Now, if you apply that to us, if we're a virtual reality and this body here is Tom Campbell's avatar, Mm -hmm. Tom Campbell is consciousness. Mm -hmm. So I'm a piece of consciousness and I'm the player. Mm Mm-hmm. And I'm playing Tom Campbell. Mm -hmm. I'm making all of Tom Campbell's choices, just like when I play the elf, I'm making all the elf's choices. Left alone, if I don't make a choice, the elf just stands there and wobbles, doesn't do anything. Mm -hmm. I have to make all the choices. So now I'm Tom Campbell consciousness, and I'm making all the choices for this avatar. Mm -hmm. Now, from the avatar's viewpoint, the computer has to be Mm non-physical, and the player has to be Mm non-physical. And because the player and the computer are um, shuffling data back and forth, right? The player says, I want my elf to run away. Mm-hmm. And the computer shows a picture of the elf running away and it computes the, the, you know, the consequences of running away. That's mm-hmm. what the computer does. Mm-hmm. And then the player says, okay, I see that. Now I want my elf to stop and turn around. Right. So then he shows the elf turning around. So it's just this, this dialogue really between the player and the computer and then there's this little calculated thing going on, which is basically just eye candy for the player so that he can get a better sense of what's going on mm-hmm. rather than seeing a bunch of printout or something would be very tedious. But so he gets to see the pictures as if all that stuff was going on. Right. And the, the computer and the player have to be in the same reality mm-hmm. because they're sharing data. You can't, you don't share data like that across reality frames. Right. So the computer and the player. Now, the, the player is consciousness. Mm-hmm. The computer is consciousness then. It's of the same sort of thing. Okay? And the so elf is only conscious of its reality, which is the, virtual. The elf is not conscious of anything. The elf has no consciousness. I am the elf's consciousness. Okay. I'm the player. Okay. I am the elf's consciousness. And now me, Tom Campbell, the consciousness, the individuated unit of consciousness, I'm playing this body here in a virtual reality game. Uh-huh. This body doesn't have a brain or a heart or circulatory system or any of that stuff unless somebody goes inside to see it. Then it'll be rendered. But until somebody cuts me open, there's no need for the system to render that. So I go through life here as if I had a brain, as if I had a heart beating, as if there were oxygen in the air. Mm -hmm. But you don't see oxygen, so oxygen never has to be computed. So this is a virtual reality, and consciousness is the computer, and consciousness is the player. But consciousness now is the source. So the source, consciousness, is an information system, right? We started with that. Consciousness is an information system. That information system can configure itself as the server and can take a piece of itself and give it free will, and that's the player. Okay. So this old idea that we're all one is true. Uh We are all one. We're all part of this consciousness thing. And our, our physical universe here, what we, the, you know, the, the avatar sees as their physical universe. That's just a, a virtual reality created for us for a reason. Uh You're an elf uh, being played. Huh? You're an elf being played. I'm an elf being played by my consciousness. Which brings me back to the question of predeterminism. (laughs) Okay. If there is a larger consciousness system and we're just elves being played in the virtual um, Mm -hmm. hologram, you know, for better than better, lack of a better term, who's playing? (laughs) My consciousness. There's things called individuated units of consciousness where they're just subsets of the source. Okay, we have consciousness, the source. So your consciousness, which has been given a subset consciousness with the element of free will, exactly. is not being completely played by a larger consciousness system that has a particular destiny in mind. Well, there is a there is a function. I mean, there's something that drives all of this. Like, why would the consciousness make the virtual reality? And what's the consciousness doing? What's its purpose? And where is it going? Right. There's, goes back to Tom Campbell, the kid. Yeah. Why did Tom Campbell, the kid, have the experiences that he had in order yeah. to become Tom Campbell, the man? Okay. So we have we have this situation, and the consciousness 
Well, uh, let me tell you, I have to maybe back up a little bit more. So let's say with my book, I start with consciousness exists. That's an assumption. Consciousness exists. Good assumption. And the other assumption I have is that uh, evolution exists. Mm -hmm. By evolution, I mean if you have a self-changing system, that system will change according to the pressures that its environment puts on it. Adaptation. Yeah, right. yeah. It'll, it'll adapt somehow to right. whatever it has to adapt to. Mm -hmm. All right. So start with the most simple piece of consciousness you can imagine. The simplest thing of consciousness, maybe I'll even call it a consciousness cell, because we like cells are kind of the name we use for a, you know, for the, the smallest piece of something. Amoebas. So this consciousness cell <laughs> mm -hmm. is basically has an awareness that it could be in state A or it could be in state B. Like a protein. There's, there's a difference in A or B. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe like a protein. I don't know if that's a good example or not. I'm thinking of prion just, proteins. They it, move from a, a alpha state to a beta state. And okay, create, so it's, know, a, it's an awareness. So we start with awareness. <clears throat> it's an awareness that it can be <clears throat> in one of two states. Right. Okay, so that's, we can make that a one and a zero if we like computers. Sure. So it's, it's, uh, that's all it is. But now you have to think that consciousness, being an information system, one of the things you need to know about information systems are that they evolve toward lower entropy. And mm -hmm. here's what I mean by that. Because of the arrow if you start time. with If you start with information and all the bits in the system are random, mm -hmm. then there is no information. Mm -hmm. All random bits, no information. Sure. If you order those bits, if you create some order and order those bits some particular way, right. now that's information. That order itself is information. Uh -huh. So an information system evolves toward lower entropy. That ordering lowers entropy. Entropy is a measure of disorder. Right. So as you right. order it, you lower entropy. Right. That is the environment that drives the evolution of consciousness. Makes sense to me. Sure. It needs to change in such a way that it creates more information, valuable information, and that the information has meaning. Uh -huh. So it starts out as just, well, I can either be in a one or a zero state. Oh, well, then I could be in a zero and then still in a zero and then in a one and then in a one. Now mm -hmm. I've got something else, you see. Right. So it can grow. It can evolve right. from just that. Right. So it does that and it evolves and pretty soon it evolves patterns and patterns of patterns and patterns of patterns of patterns because it's sure. organizing and it's, it's giving those patterns meaning. Right. It may even give them numbers, you know, oh, these are... Two ones. Why not? Right. And another two ones. Now I have four ones. You know, it could right. it could develop arithmetic and uh -huh. other things at that point. But it it's just developing patterns. It gets to a point where the next it needs another variable to work with because it's just making patterns of patterns gets old after a while, and there's only so much new stuff you can do with that. Mm -hmm. So what it does is it says, Oh, if I can take just one of my cells and right. let it go. One, zero, one, zero, one, zero. That's a metronome. Right. Now I have time. I have regular time. Right, right. So now I can make sequences of patterns of sequences. I've right. added another variable to it. Uh -huh. So it does that for a while until its evolution again slows down. And information and can only flow through time. No yeah. time, no information, right? Exactly. Right. Information changes. Right. Change has to happen with time. Mm -hmm. Ta change defines time. And the arrow of time moves in one direction. Yeah. Yes. And you might, you might note that by definition, when I say consciousness exists, mm -hmm. that also requires logically for time to exist. Right. Because if it could be in this state or that state, well, that's time. Because now it was in this, you know, this state, then it was in that state. So mm -hmm. there's time. And if it has, um, you know, if it can make that choice mm -hmm. between which state it wants to be in, mm -hmm. then it has free will mm -hmm. because otherwise there is no choice. Mm -hmm. Any choice has to be a free choice. So there, there isn't any choice. Okay. So, so next the predetermination at that point. Yes, exact okay. point. So right. just by saying my, my, uh, Initial condition, if you will, is that consciousness exists. Mm -hmm. That's the initial assumption. Right. That brings in time exists right. and free will exists. Mm -hmm. Come in with that. Mm -hmm. Because time, consciousness, and free will are all logically necessary for each other. They can't exist without the other.
you got you get all three of them in in one package, and that's that's uh, just logic. You know, you I can't have if you if you had uh, you know if you didn't have free will, then the choice of this state or that state couldn't exist. Exactly. If you didn't have time, there wouldn't be a this state and a that state. You see, because there'd be you couldn't go from one to the other. There'd be no change. So you'd two be questions. stuck in where, wherever you were. So we have free will. I'm gonna let me. I give you those two questions. Well, let me just get to yeah, the end please. of this, this yeah, line, please. And that is that now it it also then starts to plateau again because you can only do so much ordering of sequences of patterns of patterns, right. and it realizes that it needs another variable, something else to create uh, more possibilities. Uh-huh. See, it expands into possibilities, right? The things, new patterns, right. new sequences. On potentially so you, different so, timelines. So, yeah, right. So you you now need something that uh, will create more possibilities mm-hmm. because then it has a broader space to evolve into. Right. What does it do? It takes a part of itself, a subset of itself. And if right. you're into computers, you'd say it's a virtual machine. Got it. Inside the bigger machine, right? right? You can make smaller computers inside bigger computers. Like a Mandelbrot. Yeah. yeah. So it's a virtual machine. Mm-hmm. So you take a virtual machine, and that then is what I call an individuated unit of consciousness. Mm-hmm. It's, it's a subset of this larger consciousness system. It has free will. Right. It has choice. And you, you know, you give it some memory, you give it some processing, right? That's part of what you get in your virtual machine and you set it aside and it has free will. Now, because it has free will, the interactions that can take place are multiplied greatly because you don't know what they might do with each other. There's free will. (laughs) Right. And now you make a hundred of them and a thousand of them. Right. And you create a social system Mm -hmm. of these things. So Mm -hmm. you have lots of these things. They're all just subsets Mm -hmm. of the original system. Mm -hmm. They're all individuated units of consciousness Mm -hmm. within this larger consciousness system. Mm -hmm. And the whole point still is to evolve, right? right? To to lower entropy. Mm -hmm. Well, I could... I'll, I'll just make a shortcut here, but we could take the long route, which is, is more logical. But the shortcut to the answer is that in a social system, mm-hmm. the way, you know, you think of all the possibilities, the way a social, you know, way 10,000 individuals could interact with each other. Yeah. You know, what are all the possibilities? Right. Well, it turns out that the the minimum entropy is when all the people in, or all the entities in the, in the social system are cooperative mm-hmm. and caring right. about each other. Mm-hmm. If they're cooperative and caring, mm-hmm. that social system can optimize itself to lower and lower entropy. Remember, that's the thing that's pushing it, lower right. and lower entropy. Mm-hmm. In as much as you have, and I call that the like the love, you know, the love side. That's right. love, caring, right. kindness, you know, mm-hmm. appreciating others, being cooperative. Mm-hmm. The opposite of that is fear. Right. With fear, there's no trust, there's no cooperation, everything right. for me, it's all about mine, it's self-centered, mm-hmm. you know, it's that sort of thing. So that's the opposite side. So now we have this, this social system of individual units of consciousness. They are supposed to evolve to lower entropy states, which means they need to learn how to become cooperative right. and caring. Right. That's what they're all about. So here they are, and they're all just interacting with each other. That's all kinds of new possibilities now that we've got that. Mm -hmm. They're interacting with each other. But it's like being in a big chat room. Mm -hmm. Consciousness communicates. That's what consciousness does. It interacts. It communicates. Yes, it does. And the very first virtual reality was when the parent system created a communication protocols. Mm -hmm. Here's how we communicate. You know, it has to define things like vocabulary and you know, nouns and verbs and syntax and that kind of stuff so that they can communicate. So we have all these individual units of consciousness communicating. They have lots of potential, but they're not manifesting much of that potential because a big chat room just doesn't have a lot of interesting consequences. So of all that potential they have, there's only a tiny little bit of it that they're, that they're experiencing. So the system says we need a different environment. Mm-hmm. We need to create a virtual, another virtual reality that has a rule set that will provide these individual units of consciousness with some 
consequential choices, mm -hmm. ethical choices, mm -hmm. moral choices, right. choices where, where uh, caring and cooperation, you know, uh, give dividends and fear gives pain. Right. You know, we need that kind of a, of a, of a, a learning lab. So mm -hmm. it creates this entropy reduction trainer for its little units of consciousness. Mm -hmm. And the way it does that is the same way we do it in, in universities. Uh, we, you take a set of initial conditions and you give it a rule set. Okay, if you have initial conditions and a rule set, then you punch the run button and the initial conditions will change according to the rules. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, what's the initial conditions? It was a ball of plasma, very, uh, very uh, high Valuable. temperature, high pressure, mm -hmm. you see? And what is the rule set? Well, scientists jobs are to dig out the rules right. of the rule set. The rule sets how those things could change. You punch the run button, it starts to evolve. And it probably bombs the first thousand times you try it. So you adjust the initial conditions a little, you adjust the rules a little bit. Now let's turn gravity down just a little bit. That last thing just sucked back together in a wad and stayed there. Right. That didn't work. So you do this until you have a finally tuned set of initial conditions and rule set that produces a stable virtual reality. Mm -hmm. And then when that virtual reality, according to the rule set, has created, you know, first worms and then fish and then lizards and then, you know, mammals and then us, you have now avatars that the consciousness can play in this virtual reality who make choices that are hugely meaningful mm -hmm. and significant. Mm -hmm. So now you want your little, your individual units of consciousness to go log on and make all the choices for those players. Right. Because now they have not just chit chat, but now here I am, you know, I'm in this virtual reality and I've got to eat to stay alive. You know, I have maybe wife and children to protect. I need shelter. Agency, I need clothes. Right. I need all this other stuff. There's, right. there's no end of the needs. Mm -hmm. And how are you going to get that? Well, <clears throat> they're at the point that they started, they had lots of potential, but no experience. Mm -hmm. So what happens is that when they need food and there's somebody else that has food and you're bigger than they are, mm -hmm. well, you just take it. Because you need food. It's me or them. Or barter. Or barter. <laughs> or you could even be nice and say, Invite oh, somebody you know, over for dinner, yeah, right? Yeah, exactly. could, you, could you, you know, would you share and I'll help you find more. <laughs> exactly. You know, if you, there are all kinds of ways me, to play this game. Right, if you show mm -hmm. me where you got that, I can help you find more. Right, exactly. And, and so on. So right. there's lots of ways that you can play it. But the simplest way, and the way if you have no previous experience, if you mm -hmm. haven't learned... Cooperation is something you have to learn because it's not obvious that what's most obvious is grab it. You know, it's them, it's me or them. Mm -hmm. So I need the food. I take it away from them. Now it's my food. And somebody may try to take it away from me. So what do I do? I want me and my friends, we get together and make a mutual defense pack. Right. And so do other people. <laughs> and pretty soon the, the, you know, the groups are fighting each other. And, right. You know, and so on is the way that goes. And you spend more on your defense budget than you do on your <laughs> agricultural yeah. budget, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. So that's that's the whole idea. So mm -hmm. that's where this this reality comes from. Now, consciousness has created. You see, that's how consciousness creates the physical world. Mm -hmm. Now, because there is consciousness, they and this virtual reality is is efficient. It's uh, meant to be such that the players don't know that it's a virtual reality, which good virtual reality should be uh, very hard to see that it's a virtual reality. Mm -hmm. But in any case, the virtual reality only exists in the minds of the players, mm -hmm. right? There really is no virtual reality. There is no elf running around, you know, fighting with a barbarian. That's just in a computer. It's right there and on it, my television screen. Yeah, of course and, there is. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just in as much as, only the parts that I can see. Sure. That's all that's there. Right. So that doesn't really exist. So the, the actual virtual reality only exists in the minds. And actually what's going on is you have a bunch of players and they're all communicating with a server. And that is really what's going on. And all of that's being done in consciousness. Mm -hmm. You see? So if the 
if the uh, reality only exists in the minds of a player, that's why when we do a double slit experiment, mm -hmm. that the observer is important. Right. Because the game only exists in the minds of the player. So in order to get something in this virtual reality, mm -hmm. it has to come through the mind of a player. Mm -hmm. So if I'm in World of Warcraft and I want to put a bridge across a river, right, then how does the bridge get across the river? So I send data to a player showing the bridge across the river. Sure. So when that bridge becomes to a player, suddenly the bridge exists in the reality. And because this is a multiplayer game, then everybody else Gets sees it too. It, right. I have right. to give everybody who looks that way, I have to show them a bridge right. as well. Right. So reality only comes here through the minds of the players. And That's it's contagious. Why Huh? And it's contagious. <laughs> <laughs> so that's basically how things work. And so that tells you about the quantum physics and why it works that way. There is really no wave function. Like the way it works is that when, when the system needs to produce something new, mm -hmm. some you know, you dig a hole in the ground. Well, what's in there? You don't mm -hmm. know until you dig it up. It's unknown. Right. All right. So what's going to be there when you dig this hole? Well, it could be a bone, could be a rock, could just be dirt. Could be a gold doubloon if you live down around the Gulf Coast, you know, maybe Spanish origin. Who knows? Right. But it could be any of these things. And every one of these has a possibility and a probability. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what happens is the system takes a random draw from the probability distribution of the possibilities. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, that means when you take a random draw out of a distribution, that means that the things that are more probable are more likely to get picked. But it could pick something out under a, you know, the tail of the curve. But the random draw from a distribution, I don't know, maybe I could tell you this way. If you put a bunch of, if you, if you put, uh, well, that's, uh, you know, we don't want to go there. <laughs> you, you, just have to, you just have to accept that. If you want to see the details, go look at one of my uh, you know, uh, um, talks that I've, that I've given and I explain how that works. But trust me, it, it's the right mathematical language. When you make a random draw from a probability distribution of the possibilities, every possibility, think of it as a number of pieces of paper that are in a big box, mm -hmm. a raffle box with that possibility on it. Right. So if right. it's a high, if it's got a high probability and you got a lot of pieces of papers with that possibility with that outcome, on it, right. sure. you said with that outcome. And if it's a really low mm -hmm you know, probability, you only get maybe one piece of paper that has that outcome on it. So when you reach in randomly and grab something out, mm -hmm. you're likely to get the one that has the higher probability. No, so I... that's how, that's how the system, um, says what's, what's there. So you dig that hole and you stick in your shovel and you pull it up. Mm -hmm. The system takes a random draw for the probability distribution of possibilities. And that's, what's in your hole. Well, that's it, what's in your hole. And when that physicist takes his telescope and looks out into space where, you know, the best telescope ever, uh -huh. nobody's ever seen this part of space before. And he right. looks out of that space, random draw from a probability distribution of possibilities. And that's what he sees. Uh -huh. Now, once he sees it, then anybody who looks there will see the same thing because uh -huh. that's the way multiplayer games are. Sure. Right. So once you see it, it's in the reality. Once the information's come in through the con through a consciousness player, then that becomes part of the game. Uh -huh. It's like that. But now there's constraints. It can't just be any old thing. It has to be in consonance with all the information we know already, you know, right. with history. Sure. It, you're not going to look out in outer space and find... There. Right. Yeah, yeah. That's you're not going to go in outer space and find dancing hippos and tutus or something, you know, out of an I old did. Disney movie. <laughs> 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 so that's how it works. And you see, I've already... I've already solved a whole bunch of physical paradoxes with this. Uh -huh. You see, physics, what this does, it derives a better, more general physics. And it, it, the physics we have now becomes a subset of this larger understanding of the world. Sure. It becomes a subset of all those things where the uncertainty of those things is very, very small. Okay, but everything is subjective. There is nothing that is up. There is no objective world, but there's a part of our world where the, where the uncertainties are very small that is approximately objective. But even that, you know, if I, if I measure a brick, you know, how long is that brick? Well, 
it seems like it's objective, but not really. If you get it more and more accurate measurements, pretty sure. soon it becomes subjective. Right, exactly. Plus or minus, you know, it's this long, plus or minus this. It's subjective in that plus or minus right. where you're guessing. So that, but the probability there is, I mean, the, 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 uh, the probability in the right word, the um, uncertainty there is small. Mm -hmm. It's only plus or minus, you know, something in the 10th decimal place because that's the wavelength of light. And I'm using a laser to measure the length of it. Mm -hmm. But besides the surface isn't flat, the surface has all kinds of bumps and knobs and dips and all kinds of things in it. And then we get in a smaller scale and the surface is actually vibrating and moving. It's not even defined to be in a particular place. Right. So reality is only as good as our measuring devices yeah. in some ways. So, right. so if you, for all those things <clears throat> that have very little uncertainty associated with them, then they are approximately objective. Right. There is no objective world. So now we have one physics that's the, phys that's the physics of the subjective world. It's got a subset that's what we call, you know, approximately objective. Mm -hmm. And our physics, today's physics, works with that. Right. But we also have also a science of the rest of the subjective world. Mm -hmm. Why are you happy? Why are you upset? You know, why, are you, you know, why do you find misery in this life? Well, it'll tell you. And it's a science of the subjective that will explain everything subjective. Right. So that's part of it. So now there's this one overarching understanding that derives physics and answers all those paradoxes in physics that physics is stumped with. Like why, mm -hmm. again, the, the double slit experiment, you know, why, right. how does that work? Right. Well, it's just a random draw from this probability distribution. Now how it works. Why an observer? Well, it has to go through the mind of the player. Uh -huh. What about the what about relativity? Relativity key unknown there is the speed of light. Right. Why is the speed of light a constant? Well, every virtual reality has a speed limit, uh -huh. and that's you move one delta x for every delta t. Uh -huh. It's just it's your limit of your resolution. That's as fast as you can go through any virtual reality. If you jump, if you say, oh, I'm going to go 10 delta x's in the next delta t, well, now you're teleporting. You're uh -huh. disappearing from this spot and you're sure. appearing some other spot. Uh -huh. But in, in contiguous motion through this virtual reality, one delta x through every delta t is as fast as you can go. So the delta x is called a Planck uh, length and the delta t is a Planck time. You divide a Planck length by Planck time and you get the speed of light. All right. That's well, just... That's where I'm going to have to draw the line here. You're the physicist. To me, you know, I know you and yeah. Michio Kaku and Lawrence Krauss. Right. You guys write hieroglyphics so, on blackboards that are a mile long. And you say, so, see, there it is. That's yeah, the well, you can right. at least see the point that YC would have to be a constant. That's the fastest thing there is. Yeah, absolutely. Every virtual reality has a speed limit. Right. Now, a couple of other things. Um, you know that uh, uh, C, though it's a constant, that constant changes in about the eighth decimal place every now and then. It's changed like four or five times. Really? Yeah. And now we can measure it accurately out to, let's say, 10 decimal places, but it's changing in only the eighth. So it's not that we just have different measurements. Uh -huh. This is a real change. Well, what's the cause of that, do you think? Well, the cause of that is that We've a, virtual reality, a virtual reality that's efficient doesn't use any more resolution than it needs. You know, to have more resolution than you need is just extra computing right. cycles sure, that aren't right. useful. Uh -huh. So what happens is that when you need to raise that resolution because the the uh, avatars are smashing atoms and doing other things uh -huh. with more and more detail, right, right. it's you're going to have to render more and more detail. You need more resolution. Then what you do is you need to keep C as close to a constant as you can because that's pretty fundamental in, in our rule set, right? This, this value of C. Right. So what you do is you, you would take a delta X over delta T is a C, you know, distance per time is a velocity. So what you do is you, you divide each one of those, say, by two. Uh -huh. Now your delta X is half the size that it was. Okay. Your delta T is half the th size that it was. The okay. ratio, right. which is the speed of light, is the same. Okay. So the speed of light stays the same. Right. So all you have to do is... is is decrease the size of delta X and delta T in the same amount. Uh -huh. But you can't do it exactly because these things are digital. They're not analog. They're not smooth. Right. You can't necessarily just divide it in half because it's in pixels. It happens in exponentially. <laughs> yeah. Right. 
it, it's in pixels, right? right. Okay. So how do you, the, the one half actually ends up between pixels. You can't do that. You have to either pick this pixel or the pixel on the other side of that number. Right. So you can only get within a pixel of doing that. So when you make that, when you try to make that, con- that speed of light constant, you can't because at the level of which your resolution is in your game, uh-huh. They're just going to vary a little bit because they're digital. You can't move them precisely to sure. always keep that so ratio. You're on the same. Or off. Got it. Yeah. yeah. So, so that means that every time the system has had to raise the resolution because we keep digging deeper into it, it does that, and the speed of light changes, but just a little bit in that eighth decimal place. That's where it's closest. That's as close as it could get by the by the size of the pixels we're using. I see. All right. Now that Planck length and Planck time, which are like that's like the smallest pixels that you could have, but a system doesn't play everything in the smallest pixels possible. Uh-huh. It plays it in such that whatever it is rendering, it renders in no more resolution than it needs for that part of the problem. Right. So it's it's a smart. Uh, yeah, you know, we do that too. In, in the some of the simulations I've worked on, you'll have parts of it that are much higher resolution than other parts. Because if you're modeling a man walking or running, you don't need to recalculate every millionth of a second, you know, where that man is. Because right. the man just doesn't change much in a millionth of a second. Sure. Yeah. Every tenth of a second is probably good enough, you know, to, to make a pretty good model of a man. Right. Um, but anyway, or every one-thirtieth of a second. It's like movie movie pictures are like one-thirtieth, you know, of a second. Twenty-nine, uh, three, yeah. Yeah, and that makes everything look, you know, you know fluid. So enough anyhow, for our eye anyway. Yeah, you, right. yeah, for our eye that's as good as it needs to get. Sure. So it's the simulation is done at different levels of resolution based on what's needed uh-huh. at at the time. But anyway, there is the speed limit which is the fastest that you can go through one pixel Basically. for one unit of time. Right. And if you want to keep that speed limit about the same, you can still change the resolution, you just have to keep as close as you can get to that, to that uh, ratio of the delta, delta X over delta T to be uh-huh. as close to the same as you can get it. But it changes a little bit, right. which is exactly what we see. Uh-huh. There's another thing we see called the um, um, anthrop- uh, anthropic principle. Okay. The anthropic principle says that there are, or it doesn't say that, the, the, what they found, the physicist realize that there's like five or six constants, universal constants that have to do with our rule set, like gravity would be one of them. Right. You know? They have to do with our rule set that if any one of them changed out even in the eighth or ninth decimal place, the whole thing would blow up. You know, it wouldn't work anymore. Force yeah, it, it, wouldn't that, be, yeah. it wouldn't be stable. Right. The whole universe would never have lasted the five billion years or right. whatever it is that the universe is old. Right. It never would have lasted that long. Right. So, so how is it that these five or six constants are tuned to each other? If any one of them changed in that eighth decimal place, sure. the whole thing would blow up. But there's a whole bunch of these constants, all perfectly tuned to each other right. to that level of specificity. So they called that the anthropic principle because the conclusion was it sounds like this place was made just for us. You know, it all has been it's been <clears throat> fiddled with. You know, it's been Specifically manufactured. The Earth Moon uh, yeah, uh, right. Sun just, system, right? Because of the tilt is 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 absolutely perfect. Yeah, for just conditions of just for us. Earth. So right. that's what that's the that's the conclusion. Well. If you have what I described earlier as the big digital bang, right, where you have the initial conditions in the rule set, mm-hmm. well, how did that work? Well, big digital bang, take one. Mm-hmm. Oh, that bombed. Big right. digital bang, take two. Mm-hmm. Oh, that bombed, mm-hmm. et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, mm-hmm. until you have all those constants fine-tuned just right, and now it runs, and it's, it's stable. So what's the reason for that? Well, that's how the... That's how the uh, the simulation was put together it is an evolved simulation, not a program simulation. So that makes sense. And I could go on and on, but all of these things that are in physics now that are paradoxes, we know it's like that, but we don't know why. We know this Big Bang makes sense, but <clears throat> where did the ball of plasma come from? I get Couldn't it. Couldn't have come from us, right? Sure. Because we weren't there yet. 
So where did it come from? It has to come outside of what is in our universe. It was prior to our universe. Right. Well, that's simple. It was the initial conditions in the computer and a rule set. That's all. And when you hit the run button, it's there. <laughs> and you ask the elf the same thing. If you're in a virtual reality and your elf wants to go find when this virtuality started, it wants to find day one of the virtuality, what will it find? It'll go back and back further in time. Let's say it has perfect history. It'll go back, back and back, and it'll find that all of a sudden, it was there, mm -hmm. right? That's when the computer turned on. But right. now that was programmed, so the whole thing was there. Mm -hmm. Ours wasn't programmed. Ours evolved. Right. So the whole Through thing wasn't there. Error. Right. But what was there was mm -hmm. this ball of plasma. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, the T equals zero, bang, right. there's the ball of plasma and a rule set. Right. Oh, good. Well, now that makes sense. That was put there because that's how you evolve a virtual reality. You start there. You know you're so speaking anyway, the you physics of a mystic, right? Hmm? I said, you know you're speaking the physics of a mystic, right? <laughs> of course. Yeah. You see, I, I mean, now... everything that you've just espoused is pretty much in different, more lyrical yeah. language oh. expressed in emanationist theory, say, in Kabbalistic cosmology. Sure. Uh, here's is, another one. Uh, the, way, the way that the system f finds what happens next is this random draw from the probability distribution of possibilities. Mm -hmm. Well, it has to do that with everything new, mm -hmm. which means it's going to be doing that a lot. So mm -hmm. what does it have to do? Right. It has to create a database mm -hmm. of all the possibilities and the probability of each possibility. Mm -hmm. It needs that database so that when that telescope turns on, it's not caught flat-footed trying to figure out what the possibilities are. Sure. It's got to have that ready. Right. That database then, as that data gets older, that mm -hmm. database that was you know, the possibilities turns into history. Mm -hmm. Memory. That's, the, that's, why you have records. A, that's why you have the right. Akashic Records. Right, Because exactly. the virtual reality rendering engine requires that database. Mm -hmm. It can't function without that database. So there's the Akashic records. Mm -hmm. It's that database. You see? Mm -hmm. So all of these things then work themselves out very nicely. You know, and, there, and there's a couple of other features to it that because this is a learning lab, an entropy reduction trainer mm -hmm. for individuated units of consciousness, mm -hmm. any good school has to have feedback. Right. If there's no feedback, it's really hard to learn. Right. Well, the primary feedback that the system has given us is that those probabilities that determine what happens next, mm -hmm. those probabilities can be modified by our intent. Mm -hmm. So the players get, in some measure, to create the you know can create their own results that they get mm -hmm. by their intentions. Mm -hmm. So if you, that's how healing works. Yes. You modify future probability with your intent. Mm -hmm. You know, that's how, uh, you know, that's how the placebo effect works. Absolutely. You modify future probability with your intent. Absolutely. That's how you can make the sunshine next Saturday when your family has a picnic because you just keep working on it in your mind and it raises the probability that that will happen. Mm -hmm. Now, it doesn't have to happen because it's just probability and how... There's the variables in there. How, you know, how much probability do you have to change? I didn't, like want, a, I didn't want to attend that picnic and there's a thunderstorm coming next Saturday. Yeah. But how much, you know, so if, if you have to make the odds go from a thousand to one down to something that happens and it's a thousand one that it won't happen, mm -hmm. well, it's going to take an awful lot of work. Right. If it's only, you know, uh, you know, 60% to 40%, mm -hmm. well, now that's not so much work. You may be able to do that. So that's why sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work because mm -hmm. it depends on how much probability you have to move. And there's only, you know, you may be wanting the sun to come out that Saturday, but there may be some other farmer that wants it to rain. That's right. And all of those things are pushing and pulling mm -hmm. at the same thing. And that probability will end up something. And that's what it will, that's what will be the, Random draw, but that random draw could pick not out of what's most likely, but could be off a tail. I mean, mm -hmm. it's pulling a one chance maybe out of a thousand, but those things happen sometimes. Just rare stuff happens that shouldn't happen, but life is like that. Rarely, most of the time, it's not the way it works, but 
You know, it happens that way sometimes. So all of this then um, comes together to produce a model of existence, reality. It solves epistemology. It solves ont ontology. Mm -hmm. It uh, basically gives you a science of the subjective mm -hmm. as well as a better understanding of the science of the objective. Mm -hmm. It lets you, it lets you uh, solve Basically, all of the mysteries that are sitting in physics right now just fall right out, just trivially obvious why they work that way. So um, that's, the, that's the thing. I love it. It's my a very... Big toe. It really is a big picture theory of everything. But I call it mine, not because I'm so proud of it. Mm -hmm. I call it mine because it's based on my own experience. Mm -hmm. And I tell people that if it's not your experience, mm -hmm. it's not your truth. That's right. If you read somebody else's experience, well, you can decide to believe it or not believe it, mm -hmm. but it's not your truth. It's somebody else's truth. That's right. So if it's not your truth, unless you experience it, then this reality is my truth because this is what I've experienced. And I want everybody to go learn how to do it, how to, how to visit it, how to interact with it, how to connect to it for themselves. See what I mean? Personal experience combined with the experience of others working in cooperation to create, at least in part, a reality which is interacting with an energy field of some sort. Hmm. Physics makes my head hurt, but I know what he means about the need to learn to connect with this field and the benefits of doing so. It was something that Bob Monroe taught me a long time ago, and it can be learned. I share Tom's hope that you will at least become curious about how you might do that personally. Be sure to tune in for the next episode where Tom and I discuss his big theory of everything more in depth and go a little bit deeper down the rabbit hole about such things as free will, the nature, and the origins of consciousness. I may even relay some of your questions. Until then, I hope you can digest what's been said thus far, personally. I think I need more fiber in my diet. Fiber, physics, I don't know. Have a good day. Be certain to tune in again to Expanding on Consciousness to become informed on the fascinating field of consciousness studies and its applications. The views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the guests and the host. They do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of the Monroe Institute. Expanding on Consciousness is underwritten and produced by the Monroe Institute, copyright 2022, and is broadcast by permission. Reproduction or redistribution without the express written consent of Monroe Institute is prohibited by law. For more information about Expanding on Consciousness, visit our website at monroeinstitute.org or connect with us on the socials. Thank you for listening.